Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to you. My name is Erin Williams, and I'm your host for today's webinar, Word Document Accessibility, Part 2. All right, let's get started. Last month, DAISY hosted the webinar titled Word Document Accessibility 101, which covered the fundamentals of creating documents that can be read by everyone. This covered document structure, image descriptions, basic tables, hyperlinks, and of course, the Microsoft Accessibility Checker. By popular demand, we're returning to the topic of making accessible Word documents, and we will continue our journey beyond the basics. Through practical example, our presenters will share how to use Word features so you can work smart when creating accessible content. And we will return to some topics that were featured in the Q&A session for a deeper dive, guiding us through how to resolve common challenges. There's a lot for our speakers to sink their teeth into, so let's turn it over to them, and I'll ask our panel to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. I am Prashant Verma. I'm working as Accessibility Specialist with DAISY Consortium. Hello, everyone. My name's Richard Orm, and I, too, work at the DAISY Consortium. And let's get going with an overview of what we're going to cover in today's webinar. We'll look at top tips for checking alt text on images, magically applying the missing headings and using power search and replace to improve your Word document. Then we'll take a deeper dive into tables. There were so many questions on tables in our last webinar and also accessible text boxes. We discussed some of the approaches today. We'll show you uh, to how to apply some of the features that we were discussing. Before finishing up with talking about charts, file names and templates, and then we'd love to hear your questions. Okay, let's start though with a reminder. And as Erin just mentioned, uh, we have previously done the Word Accessibility 101 webinar. And the slide deck and the video of that session is available for you to rewatch and share with your colleagues at daisy.org forward slash webinars. And so there's lots of great information in there. We're going further in this webinar. And what we're going to first is top tips for checking alt text. Yeah, thanks Richard. So to make the document accessible, it is necessary to provide alt text to all the images. And people often find this process very time taking and tedious as this involves uh, selecting the images one by one and then opening its uh, uh, properties. However, we have figured out that the search feature of Microsoft Word can be used to make this process uh, faster and easier. So Richard is, uh, uh, is displaying a document which has many images. So the first thing you will need to do is uh, display the all text of one of the images. So just uh, right click on any image and then choose edit all text. So the task pane will open and on the right side, you will see the all text of the currently selected image. Now what you can do is you can use the search feature of Microsoft Word. Uh, in the home tab in editing, you find the search feature or you can also just press control F to bring up the search uh, pane. Now here you should, you have to type the, the code uh, for the image, which is caret G, and then click on find next. Uh, so what will happen then is uh, it, it will select the next image and uh, uh, display its alt text. Now to quickly move to the next image, you can use the keyboard shortcut control page down and control page up for the previous image. Richard, I think you have um, in this document, uh, you can maybe highlight uh, if the alt text needs to be improved for any, any image. Thanks, Prashant. Thank you for talking me through that. So uh, I've done control F and then carrot G as you indicated. Uh, and now I'm using control page down uh, to move between the different images. And on the right hand side, the uh, edit area in the alt text uh, is being updated. So this is a really quick way of moving through and checking and whoa, here where I am, I found an image here, um, which has just got the alt text uh, image. 
So at this point, I could now type uh, some much better alt text. Uh, and then I can just continue um, with my searching through, checking the alt text. And indeed, when I get to uh, an image that is marked as decorative, this is shown with a checkbox on the mark as decorative uh, and the image uh, area, the area where the alt text would be typed is grayed out as well. So a really handy way of moving quickly between the images in your document and checking both the alt text that's there and whether or not it is marked as decorative. Yes, and this uh, tip will work with the older Office versions also. The difference will be that the alt text will be displayed not in the task pane, but in a dialog box. But you can, you can use the same search feature and the same keystrokes there as well. Great. So uh, let's move to the next tip then, magically applying headings. Yes. So very often we find uh, documents in which the section names and subsection names are made prominent uh, through formatting, like by using a larger font, by using an underline or a different color. But they don't actually have heading styles applied on them. So uh, here we have the document uh, about sinking of the Titanic. And uh, you can see that the section names are visually prominent. Uh, but if we open the navigation pane from the view tab, uh, we find that there are no heading styles actually. This document doesn't have any headings. There's no structure. And creation of a structure is, is like the most important thing for making a document accessible. One can go through the document and apply the heading styles on each section and subsection, but there is an easier way. Uh, if the sections have somewhat similar uh, text formatting, then we can select uh, all of them at one go. So Richard here is selecting one of them, like starting out. And uh, then in the uh, home ribbon, we can, we can choose the option select. Uh, yeah, Richard, maybe you can just highlight and you can, you can just uh, sure. uh, take, take us through, yes. So my ribbon is a little bit different because I've reduced the screen resolution so that things are easier to see through the screen sharing. Um, but uh, it, so it's in the editing group and then I've got select and then I've got select text with similar formatting. So if I select that, what, what's, what's that doing for me then Prashant? Yes, it will select um, all, all text with similar formatting throughout the document. You can maybe just scroll through and you will see that uh, um, even blank lines, uh, like which are technically blank paragraphs, even those will be selected. And now what we can do is we can apply a suitable heading style on them. Um, I think um, these should be heading two, uh, as far as I understand this document. So you can just uh, select heading two in the home tab and all of them will then have heading two style. So now Prashant, if I go back to that uh, navigation um, bar, now I'm seeing that I've got some headings here. Yes, you have got uh, all the headings, heading twos. Uh, looks like there are a few um, blank lines as well. We will deal with them soon. And, and you can also use the same trick to apply styles on, on the main sections like heading ones and heading threes and so on. So that was a very fast way of applying, giving my document heading structure. Clearly I would need, as you just said, um, to, if there were different heading levels like uh, one, two, three, four, I'd need to do it for each one. But each time I do it, I'm hopefully um, creating a whole number of different headings and it's much faster than going uh, through manually. Yes. What if and, I don't uh, like the way that the heading is actually looking? I actually preferred how the heading was before. What can I do about that, Prashant? Yes, so uh, if you don't like the look and feel of the headings, then you can modify the style. So in the home tab, you just right click on the, on the heading style, like maybe heading two, and then choose modify. And here you can now uh, select a uh, desired font and size um, and, and make it look the way you want it to. Okay. That sounds fine. So before, for example, it was underlined, so be able to underline um, this particular um, 
uh, item here, for example. Okay, that sounds good. Yes. And all the um, headings across the document will be updated. There we go. So sometimes people kind of don't like the st adding styles, even though it adds the structure, because they say they don't like the way the styles look. This is to address that comment, which is you can adjust the styles however you like. You don't have to stick with the ones that come uh, out of the can, as it were. Great. So what's next then, Prashant? OK, um, I think now we can uh, uh, demonstrate how we can use the, the search feature to correct the document. We can, we can actually remove empty paragraphs, like blank lines. Some of them could be empty headings as well. And we can also use the same feature to remove extra spaces and also, when, when necessary, uh, tab stops, manual line breaks, page breaks, etc. So let's uh, now demonstrate this, uh, starting with uh, blank lines. In this document, uh, this there are many uh, blank Very lines. Really so, uh, so, uh, so to to remove all of them, what we can do is uh, we can use the search feature. So in the home tab, in the editing uh, group, you can open the replace uh, uh, tool. Now. In the uh, find what field, you will need to type caret p caret p twice to indicate that we are looking for two consecutive paragraph breaks. Richard has actually also uh, um, um, highlighted the the marks, the paragraph marks. You can actually see that uh, in this document, just below the image, there is one one blank line, or or you can say. An, a paragraph, and then there are two more consecutive paragraph breaks towards the bottom of the page. So all these things we can remove um, at once very quickly using this uh, find and replace uh, tool. In the replace with, you will need to type caret p. So we want to say to Microsoft Word that find instances of consecutive two consecutive paragraph breaks and replace it with one. Now click on replace all. You will get a message that so many replacements were made. In this case, uh, 72 replacements. Click OK and then repeat the process. Click on replace all again. Again, uh, it will say that so many replacements were made. So depending on how your document is, you may need to uh, click on replace all again and again till it says that zero replacements were made. Okay, sometimes it will it will stick to one replacement. In such a case, you can click on find next, and then it will show you where that uh, that um, um, you can say the culprit is where there is one more paragraph break which which can which not getting removed. Now here it is in between tables, and that can be uh, removed manually. Yes. Yeah, Richard, I think now your document uh, doesn't have any uh, blank lines or empty headings. Yeah, looks like we've sorted that out. Uh, however, um, people are often putting in two paragraph breaks because they want to make more space between the paragraphs. So we've improved the accessibility by not having these kind of blank lines between the paragraphs. But actually, this isn't looking visually how I want it to, how, how can I resolve that? Yes, so Microsoft Word provides the paragraph spacing and line spacing features. We can make use of that. So for example, if you want more white space before and after the headings, so we can select uh, um, the heading, one of those heading styles, and then we will need to go into the paragraph dialog, which is also in the home ribbon. And then there is a, uh, before and after uh, field. So there we can mention the spacing we want in points. So maybe say 18 points uh, before certain headings and, and maybe you can say 12 points after certain headings. So, uh, and then if you click okay and go back to the document, so you will see that uh, now that that spacing has been applied. 
visually it, it is looking better now and and technically also it is correct so same thing can be done for for paragraphs uh, so headings paragraphs lists wherever you want you can change the uh, spacing before and after okay so while you've been talking prashant i've done that uh, i've got back to having the space between the paragraphs but if i do that um, reveal codes um, keystroke so that's shift control 8 or uh, control asterisk however um, we can see that there is just the one paragraph break but after the paragraph we've now got this space so visually this is more like what i'm after now so i'm, I'm happy again with that yeah. so you mentioned also the possibility of removing spaces and tabs would you want to just tell us about why that is a good idea uh, yes so um, I mean, we, we want to create a uh, document which is good from every point of view. So the, even the accessibility checker will point out if there are empty spaces, additional spaces. Uh, so not just blank lines. Sometimes uh, people put uh, more than one space between words or after sentences. If that is the case, you can use the find and replace tool and there you can type, uh, uh, put two spaces, like press the space bar twice in find what, and in replace with, you can put one space and uh, repeat the uh, replace all uh, uh, button. You click on it several times till your document no longer has additional spaces. Similarly, uh, when you copy text from web pages or PDF files, they may sometimes have like tab stops or they may have many section breaks, manual line breaks. All of those can be removed using the find and replace uh, tool. Uh, but you have to be careful. Uh, not all documents require that. And sometimes you can actually uh, disturb the, the layout or the formatting. So, uh, but yes, if need required, you can use it and you can correct the whole document very quickly. Great. Thanks then. Um, so let's move to the next topic. Um, so that's power search and replace using the features of Word to quickly give yourself a better document. We wanted to turn and spend a little bit more time on tables because we had so many questions on tables last time and we talked about the approaches, but we didn't have a chance to demonstrate them. And uh, we got questions around merged um, cells uh, and also uh, alt text and tables. So back to this document then, and towards the end of it in this demo document, um, we have uh, some tables here. Uh, and here's a table that Prashant, you've explained, you see uh, quite a few times when you're giving your trainings or providing technical support. It looks like an okay table to me. Um, the table starts, the first row is uh, impact, rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, and then we've got a pretty straightforward uh, four columns and a number of rows um, to it. Uh, what's the problem with this uh, table here, yes. Prashant? Yes, so the accessibility guidelines say that uh, we, we should create simple tables, avoid merging cells as far as possible. This is because uh, people who use assistive technology like screen readers, they, they can um, um, use, use the various uh, commands to read out the column headings. Here in, in this table, what will happen is that uh, they will hear the, the table name or the table heading as the, as the column heading for all the columns. So, uh, so that is the problem and we can easily uh, fix it. In this case, uh, we, can, we can take out the, the heading of the table and put it just outside and just delete the, now the blank row. So now the table has the first row of the table contains column headings. So it is easy to navigate and understand for uh, many people with disabilities. And it doesn't make a difference because the, the table heading is just above it and, and, and there's no problem, I think, visually as well. Okay, so I think I fixed that. I just copied the text out of that first row. I pasted it above. Of course, I could format it how I like. Uh, and then I deleted that row. So now we've got a regular um, a table here and someone who's using a screen reader when they land in a cell uh, and they use a keystroke in their screen reader to hear the 
or indeed it may automatically read out the column heading. It'll read out, in this case, in the third column target as the row heading rather than the title of the whole table. I get it. That works. Here's a second example, Prashant. This is, again, not the most complicated um, table. Um, we've got one, two, three, four, five um, columns here. Uh, with a number um, and different columns. And then on the right hand side, I see this too. We've got um, a, an estimated rate and a quoted rate in two different columns. And rate is set as a kind of heading for those two columns. So what's the challenge here that's presented for someone who's using assistive technology? Yes, so for both the estimated and uh, quoted columns, uh, they will hear the heading as rated rate. So that is the problem. And I think Richard, you can easily fix it by, uh, by removing rate as the heading of these two columns and, and uh, um, changing the headings to rate estimated and rate quoted. Okay, so what I've done is I've clicked into that cell that was merged and Word gave me the option to split the cell. Um, so it's now split it. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to now merge these cells. Um, so I'll, I'll click the buttons and then have another go at explaining this. Can't do two things at once. So I had effectively two rows um, in, in that uh, right hand top corner and I've merged it so that we've just got the one cell that's the same uh, height as it were as the other um, cells along here. And so the first cell reads rate estimated. Mm, okay, maybe that's good enough. Maybe I would change it to estimated rate. And the right hand side, it says quoted Well, actually, so it's missing the heading that was there before. So now I've that added that in. So I've now got a regular uh, simplified table structure. I don't know that anything's particularly been lost um, from this table as a result. We've got a slight bit of reputation in that the column heading uh, for the last two columns are rate estimated and rate quoted. But someone who's using assistive technology, when they land on the um, value five, can check what that actually means. And before they just got told rate, but they didn't know if it was estimated or quoted. Now they'll get that information correctly. This is, um, this is showing the principle of this. Clearly there are um, tables that are more and less complicated, but the notion is that you demerge so yeah, you demerge the cells uh, so that you have a regular kind of layout because you understand the way that the screen reader would work. Uh, and then you just have to kind of think about what's the most sensible um, heading for that particular um, row or column. Okay, that seems to work. What about alt text and tables then? So uh, here I am in a table, I can do right click and I can go table properties. And one of the uh, property sheets here is alt text. And it's telling me that um, titles and descriptions can be useful for people with vision or cognitive impairments. So I could put a lot of effort into typing a description um, of this table. Uh, what should I put? And should I put anything, Prashant? So the table alt text is not like readily discovered by screen readers and I think some similar technologies. But there may be some use cases. Um, so one can provide all text. I will say this is optional uh, because the, the current screen readers, they uh, inform the readers as to how many columns the table has, how many rows it has. Uh, as, they, as they go through the table, they are able to read out the column headings. So um, despite this, if there is some other additional information, uh, another uh, some helpful information that can be inserted as all text. So don't rely on the alt text in order to make your inaccessible table accessible. You need to format it correctly, uh, but also don't feel you have to spend a lot of time describing the layout of the table if it is a simple table, because the screen reader will do that for someone. Um, but if there's a particular reason, there's no harm in putting it here. We're just not sure how discoverable it is. Maybe it's a bit like um, adding some properties in, um, maybe at a future date, or if you're creating Braille or something like that, it may be useful. But uh, at the moment, that would be the kind of recommended approach um, on tables. 
if your practice is different, uh, if you know different, then please chime in on the Q&A um, channel. Okay, we also talked last time about text boxes. And we said that if uh, text boxes are used using the kind of regular um, features of Word, they go in as a shape. They're really hard to discover with assistive technology. And they're also floating images. Um, so we're not even sure where they would appear uh, in the reading order. So we've put um, a, a text box into this Titanic document. Let's have a look for that. Uh, and here's the text box. Well, it's been put in there because it's a quote from the captain of the Titanic. So the author of this document wanted it to kind of be visually to stand out uh, and to distinguish it from the surrounding um, text. Um, why don't we uh, have a little go with a screen reader? So we'll start narrator here. Demo document dot docx compatibility mode word window demo document dot docx compatibility mode editing. Grief and outrage. Carpathia arrived at Pier 34 in New York on the evening of the 18th of April after a difficult voyage through Hakai to the disaster. Communication is a little bit more quickly. It, sinking that the foot. Text box 2. Text box. Text wrapping square. The prevailing public reaction to the disaster was one. So after reading the heading and then the first paragraph of this uh, part of the document, it then told me I had a text box and there was text box wrapping. It didn't read me the contents of it. And then it went on to read the next paragraph, except the next paragraph is actually still before the text box in the document. And this is because these text boxes are floating um, uh, items within your Word document. Uh, and as people edit their document and move things around, they want this to be particularly on one page or whatever, um, the text box can kind of become a uh, come adrift from its original position uh, within the document. They're just really not uh, a safe way of including content. And, and also, if you then go to export this to another format, um, such as uh, Braille or, I don't know, maybe PDF, uh, the contents of this text box can just be uh, lost, um, depending on the conversion technique you're doing. So. What we said last time, Prashant, is there are other ways of creating a text box in a way that visually still works, but is better for someone who's using assistive uh, technologies such as read aloud or a screen reader or uh, or whatever. So how would I do that with this one here? So uh, you can use the borders and shading tool to achieve more Page or less 11. the same uh, visual text presentation. Exiting narrator. So in this case, uh, you will need to copy the text which is inside the uh, text box and then delete the text box, okay? And now paste the contents of the text box at, at a logical place in this document um, after a certain paragraph. And now select this paragraph and uh, give it a suitable border and maybe shading as well. And if somebody wants maybe a little bit of indenting also to further highlight it, so that will do. Okay, so I'm, Never actually too sure where to find that in the um, in the Word uh, menu system. So I'm using the Tell Me feature here, that little search box on the title bar of Word, uh, which means I don't have to remember uh, where it is. So here we are. I've typed border into that. The shortcut key to go up there is uh, Alt Q, and then I'm choosing borders and shading. No doubt there's a way of finding it through the menus really easily as well. So what do you reckon? First of all, we're going to play with, uh, what, putting a box around it? Yes, yeah, the plain uh, border. And, oh, yeah. and let's make it a little bit thicker. So uh, one point wide. Um, okay, that's fine. And then yeah. the one we had before had a kind of blue shading to it. So maybe I can complete that with having, uh, choosing a nice blue color for it. Click on okay and well, to me, that looks like a like a text box. Um, and now I would expect the reading order to be correct. I'll just try that out now. So starting up narrator. Demo, when so many others died. Why did Titanic proceed into the ice field at full speed? Ismay himself later said, what do you think I am? Do you believe that exiting narrator? Okay, yeah. so that appeared to work. 
visually. Um, so in the text box itself, I had maybe the option of having a graduated tint and stuff like that. So it's not as advanced, um, but uh, clearly what we win from on the accessibility side uh, far outweighs, I think, uh, the fact that it's not got a like a tint uh, to the background shading. Okay, so that's creating text boxes that work for everyone. Um, sometimes we see text boxes and um, Prashant that kind of on the side of the text and there's kind of wrapping going on on the uh, maybe on the left hand side and there's maybe a quote or an exercise on the right hand side of uh, things. Uh, what's the approach to that in um, a format such as Word? Uh, we should actually keep these things in line with text. Um, the reading order should be very simple and predictable. Uh, because yeah, I mean, they may not be accessible at all. They may not be discovered at all. So, so because of that reason, we need to um, change that kind of layout. Great. Thank you for that. Okay, so let's move on then uh, on our agenda. And we're going to look at charts. So I'm not sure we got into this um, last time. We, we talked about images and image descriptions, and we demonstrated how to do that. Uh, but we've had some messages through from people saying, what about charts? And we're not quite sure what they mean by that in terms of, uh, do they mean images that contain charts or charts themselves? So we've decided to kind of cover the whole thing uh, in this little section. Um, so in our um, document here, uh, we have uh, a chart. And this is one that has been created um, in Microsoft Excel and then uh, included uh, within Microsoft Word. That's the whole beauty of this suite, that you've got these different applications that play together. Um, and I know it's a chart because when I start clicking inside it, I can actually move objects um, around. Um, uh, but to all intents and purposes, the work's been done in Excel. This is the result. It's a visual representation um, of the data, in this case around first quarter visitors to some websites. And there's some information there about January, February, March, and a total. OK, well, let's see what the experience of this is like with um, a screen reader. Demo document dot docx. Compatibility mode. Word window. Demo document dot docx. OK, so I'm going to move to the chart. Chart area. OK. Blank. All right, so I heard there was a chart there, but I didn't get anything about it. Um, now, a chart within Word, chart area. you can so, um, add narrator. alt text to it, uh, but actually the alt text is not read by many screen readers. Um, so the first thing would be to provide, I think, a reliable way where the alt text works uh, and you're kind of faced with something that um, is not confusing. Uh, the experience with some screen readers when you come across a chart in Word and as you're cursoring through, it actually starts kind of navigating you through some of the menus that pop up such as the flow and editing the uh, colors and this kind of stuff. We see these visually on the right-hand side of the chart when we get to it. So it can be a confusing experience for someone who was just wanting to read a document and not expecting to get into editing a chart. Um, so uh, the approach to, to start with with this would be to select the chart itself, not something within it. Um, so by selecting the chart itself and then doing right click, and one of the options we have is save as picture. So what we're talking about here is saving the chart as an image in order for us to then include uh, into the document. So I've uh, done this already. I'll overwrite that one there. And then what I'm going to do is delete the chart and then insert a picture from my device. There's my chart and it's back in again. Looks just the same. But unlike before, if I try to click on elements within the chart, they don't work. This is now a kind of flat uh, image. And now I have the option of being able to put some text um, in here. And I might want to describe this uh, chart. There's actually quite a lot to it. Um, what can be done, Prashant, with alt text and some more complex images like, uh, like a chart? So I could say this is a chart. Maybe that's what I should do. This is a chart showing the first quarter visitors 
uh, in 2021 to example.com websites, but that's not really an equivalent uh, experience, is it, Prashant? What's the approach one should take? Yes, this kind of chart requires a much longer description. Actually, it requires a, a lot of numerical data, like almost uh, this chart can be converted to a table even. So that kind of description can be act, uh, put just below the chart, or it can be put somewhere at the end of the document. And we can provide a link just below this chart to, to be able to just jump to the description. Um, so there are different approaches, but yes, it requires a longer description. Sometimes the description can itself include a table also. Okay, so um, I've actually got some text already prepared. Uh, here we are. So I'm going to grab the description of the bar chart and uh, a table and then paste it below this image here. Um, now what I might, th this is now visually kind of interfering with my document, Prashant. Um, so actually, uh, I'm not so happy with this. It's fine if it's a special document I'm creating for a student, maybe it's an adaptation of uh, a particular textbook or um, course module. Uh, but this is my company report that I want to put out, and I don't want to put all this blurb underneath it. So what's the approach I should do to make sure my document is both accessible and also really kind of um, presentable and, and professional and so on? You talked about linking to something. Yes, yes. So you can cut and paste this description, maybe in the appendix somewhere at the end. And then uh, um, just below the chart, you can create a link like a same page link, uh, same that kind of a link, same document link, so that people who need it, who need to read the description can, can just uh, go ahead and um, jump to the description. Something like this. I won't make the link now, but I could do something like that, which yeah. means, so I've written link to extended description uh, underneath it. Um, uh, and then someone with assistive technology, as they move through would hear that, if they wanted, if they were interested in that chart, they could then jump and it would take them to that appendix later on in the document, uh, read it, and then one would put a link back to the chart here and they could continue to read. And so then visually uh, and for printed copies, that's then not so disruptive um, to the text. Well, that would make a, a very accessible version of this um, document then and this chart, because the way that this extended description it works is that there's an overview that's been written uh, that describes it. And then the data is presented actually uh, as a table, which means that the, the source data, if you like, for this table can be explored. So someone can work through um, the numbers for a particular site or across a particular date or, or something like this. Very nice. Yeah, excellent. Okay. All right, back to our agenda then. Uh, so just to remind us on this one, the approach would be first of all, to convert your chart to an image, then add alt text. And if your alt text is not sufficient, which would be the case if it's anything other than a really simple chart, then consider adding an extended description and maybe even an alternative uh, presentation such as the table data um, that you saw there. Okay, um, so next then, uh, we've got our last topic, which is around file names and templates. Um, so if one reads about, you know, making Word documents accessible, one of the things that gets mentioned, you know, maybe on the Microsoft site and on uh, other sites, the 508 site, they talk about file names. So that's not actually part of the document itself, but what, why do file names matter, Prashant? What's that got yeah, to do are, with accessibility? Yeah, there are two things. So the file name should be descriptive so that people, uh, before opening the file, they, they can get to know like what is inside the file. It helps them in classifying the files, uh, in arranging those files. Secondly, uh, the file name itself uh, should not be containing spaces. As a Word document, it doesn't matter. But when the Word document is converted to some other formats, then some of the conversion tools uh, do not uh, work well with spaces inside the file names. And um, the, the resulting formats may have missing pictures or some other issues. 
So because of that, uh, we have to take care of the file names, uh, write very descriptive file names. And uh, instead of spaces, we can use the underline, sometimes the dash, or even sometimes the camel case, where we uh, put the first letter of each word uh, in uppercase. Um, so uh, I sometimes use spaces in the file names that I create. As you say, if it's just something within Word, that probably doesn't cause a problem. But if I'm looking then to share that um, document with other folk, uh, I could go and rename those um, files and uh, changing each space for an underline. Um, I actually use a tool from Microsoft, a free tool called Power Toys. Uh, and this has uh, a renaming um, feature as part of it, which means I would just uh, go into the Windows File Explorer. I would right click uh, on the file name that I want to rename and Power Toys will have added in an extra feature, which is the renamer. And I can just tell it that I want the spaces to re be replaced with an underline and it makes it really easy to do that little um, change. Uh, underline or dash, as you say, uh, Prashant, that works fine. Okay, um, also in the training that you do, uh, Prashant, you sometimes come across organizations that are using templates. So templates, these are kind of pre-set up um, Word documents with, um, I don't know, headers and footers and fonts and all those sorts of things. So templates, are they good or bad for accessibility? So the templates, uh, if they are tested for accessibility beforehand, then, then they are good because uh, when people use templates, they tend to create similar documents as far as the structure and the look and feel is concerned. But if the template itself has some accessibility issues, um, then yeah, then all documents based on that template uh, will unfortunately be not accessible or will have the same issues. And you see that in the wild, do you, Prashant? Yeah, very often. So sometimes like people use the, the tables to lay out the, their logos and some other things, uh, which, which, is, which is not accessible, uh, which is not the right way table should be used. Um, then uh, people also uh, tend to uh, make use of certain font size and colors for the sections and subsections and don't really promote the use of heading styles. So that is also uh, an accessibility issue. So I guess if an organization has picked a bad template, uh, they're effectively forcing their employees to create inaccessible documents because they don't have the power to change that maybe. But if you create an accessible template, then you're forcing or helping your uh, colleagues to create accessible um, document. It, it, it works that way around too, surely. Yeah, of course, yes. Well, where then could you get some accessible templates? Um, well, actually Microsoft themselves have created some accessible templates as part of the Office template store. Uh, you can get them actually from within um, Office applications. So within Word, you can go to File, New, and then in you can look for accessible templates uh, and, and pull up some online um, templates that you can then download to your computer uh, and use. So you would go File, uh, and then you type accessible templates into the Search for Online Templates box. Now, what's interesting is that some of these templates actually are set up with a little kind of guide at the end of them. Um, so another route you can go is if you go to templates.office.com uh, and search for accessibility, there are some templates there which are set up with accessibility in mind, which means that um, they're using the accessibility features um, of Word, and then they've been improved with better color contrast, They've used larger fonts. They've used described images, simple table structure, heading structure, meaningful link text, and so on. But after the template itself, there's a kind of guide to creating your own accessible template or modifying the one that's there. So take a look at the templates uh, on, um, on the Microsoft uh, store there at templates.office.com for some really good resources to guide you on how to make accessible templates. So then we'll just move to questions uh, in a moment if there are some, um, but let's just do a quick uh, recap. 
So Prashant showed us how there are some top tips for some really efficient uh, accessibility improvements to your Word documents, turning what would otherwise be quite menial and repetitive tasks uh, into things that really mean that you can change lots of things in your document at once. We had a look at how you can move through the images and review the alt text and whether the images are marked as decorative. We showed how you could instantly apply styles to similarly formatted paragraphs, and then you can adjust the styles to make sure that they meet your or your customer's um, preferences for how that should look within the document. And Prashant also told us about the carrot technique, that little up pointy arrow thing, uh, and combined uh, with G, we can look for graphics, but P, we can search and replace for multiple paragraphs uh, and tabs um, and other features too. Then we had a look at tables. We went back to uh, some of the uh, table questions that came up last time, and we showed you what we meant by how to deal with uh, merge cell um, issues. And we also showed you how you can make boxes in your Word document using borders and shading, which means that the text then is in the reading order. We then looked at charts and had a discussion around file names and templates. And that's what we squeezed into 45 minutes of us talking. Uh, and that pretty much rounds up our presentation. So Erin, I guess it's back to you to see if there are any questions for us. Thank you, Prashant and Richard. That was very informative. I do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, um, the, the, the comment I struggle to convey to others who aren't a, a potential answer. To me, alt text is provided to those to include those who can't see an image. And alt text will give textual description of what's on the screen. Yes. Where a caption would provide general information or perhaps give credit to the source of an image. And it's meant to be consumed by everyone. I think you nailed it there, uh, Erin. We saw this a little bit in the Titanic example where the first image is a, um, a painting and it, it gives the name of the painting uh, and, the, um, and the painter. But what it doesn't do is describe how it shows lifeboats being lowered, um, it's a black and white and so on. These, um, these things for someone who's accessing the document and, um, and the image non-visually, that's what would go in the alt text. And if actually the uh, information that you need to convey is already in the caption, then you don't need to provide um, the alt text, uh, of course. So it's there once you've reviewed what's in the document to see uh, whether you need to go further with the alt text. Yeah, I, I don't was know if that say, was a strategy. I was really a kind of the explanation of the difference between them. So I don't know if that, that uh, helps. Probably the question already knew that, but. Yeah, sometimes people tend to copy the caption and put it inside the alt text. So that should not be done at all because it, it becomes a repetition. So screen readers uh, will read the caption kind of twice, once as alt text and once as caption. Thank you. Another question is, how many words exactly can someone put, alt, put in the alt text in order to be read and not be a problem in DAISY or EPUB books? So is there a character limitation they should be targeting? Uh, um, I, I think there is a limitation uh, in, within Word. Uh, I'm not sure how much that is. But what we have to remember is that uh, um, when the document is converted to uh, EPUB or DAISY, or even within the Word document itself, people cannot navigate the uh, alt text word by word or sentence by sentence. So they will read it at one go with their tools. So uh, it should not be too long. Otherwise, uh, people will not really be able to understand it. What we've heard on our image description webinars is a good way of thinking about the length of your alt text or the maximum length of your alt text is to think about it in terms of it being a tweet. Uh, now I know that tweets have got longer, I think, um, <laughs> but really should be, I, I think the guidance that's given in Microsoft Word itself is when it talks about one or two sentences, uh, that feels about right um, to me. And I think that's what was echoed by our experts in the describing images um, webinars. And to add to that, the w3.org has a 
a recommendation not to go more than 200 characters. So if you wanted a character limit, um, but just go in the guidance of it should be a tweet. Now I've seen people go longer if they're describing images of um, graphics. But the, yeah, I guess I've the, the, seen I've the seen limit different exactly is 1024 characters if you really want to be precise. Oh, is it really? Okay. <laughs> Within word. Correct. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, I've seen uh, numbers used in the past, I'm sure you you have as well, Prashant, that were based around what a particular screen reader was able to handle. And that information is out there on the web now. So people kind of uh, repeat it understandably, uh, but actually the uh, screen readers have been updated and they're made more powerful. So that isn't a limit anymore. It's really around what is it you're trying to achieve rather than the technical um, issue of it. And you don't wanna just give someone a wall of text, a long, long load of text uh, to have to wade through because it's not um, navigable. Great. Yeah. Wonderful, all right. Well, thank you guys. And thank you, Richard and Prashant for sharing this great information. Just for everyone's um, edification, our next webinar will be on April 21st and is titled Exploring Reading App Accessibility. There are many different apps for reading digital publications. How do you know which offer the accessibility features you need and which to avoid? Well, the good news is that reading apps are regularly evaluated for accessibility features and the results are made public. The session exploring reading app accessibility will explain the basics of reading apps and describe the most important features different users will be interested in. Our presenters will reveal the latest results and recommendations and also point you toward a growing set of resources to help users and support staff in getting started with these apps. You can register for this webinar at daisy.org forward slash webinars, where you can also sign up for the announcement mailing list and review previous webinar recordings and resources. I hope you'll join us again soon. In the meantime, thank you for your time. Stay safe and well, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.